Turning, please, to Psalm 138. Psalm 138. I'm a, a little scatterbrained this morning. Uh, my mind, I've been running here and there and everywhere all morning. We turned the lights on for the baptistry. It's the only lights in the church that went out, wouldn't come on. And uh, kind of went from there, just running from one thing to another. But it's been a great day, day here already. Uh, my heart's been blessed. I hope yours has been encouraged uh, with the testimonies that God is in the business of changing lives, saving souls, making a difference in our lives. And we give him the praise and the glory for that. This is Thanksgiving Day, Thanksgiving Sunday, and the title of the message is this, what are your plans for Thanksgiving? If I approached you at the door, you know, I've been standing outside this morning and as you came in and said, you know, what, what's your plans for Thanksgiving? Most of us would have answered how. Well, we're, we're having some family over or we're going to mom's or whatever plans you had, and we're going to have turkey, or we're going to have ham, or whatever it is that you have on Thanksgiving, and that would be your plans, but that's not what I'm asking you. What are your plans for Thanksgiving? As Christians, shouldn't that be part of our plan? (laughs) If we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving Day, we should be thinking about, what am I going to thank God for? Maybe we should have written a few things down just to stop and think about what God's done in this last year that has blessed our hearts, things he's doing for us. And I think that's kind of what David here, the author of Psalm 138, was going through his mind, just thinking about how good God had been for him, how great God is in his person, but also in the way that he treated David. And I want you to read with me here, beginning in verse 1 of Psalm 138. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name. What are you going to praise him for, David? For your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord. When they hear the words of your mouth, yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly. But the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. And your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. Father, thank you. We've been blessed here already today. We thank you for those that to follow you in baptism. To take a stand for what they believe about Jesus Christ. And, and Lord, to be counted. Father, we, we pray you continue to guide and direct and bless in these lives. And for those, Lord, at the end of this service that will join together with us as part of our church family. Lord, would you just, Father, would you just today minister your grace here in our midst. Father, we've already prayed about the situation in Israel. We pray for the situation in Ukraine, and Lord, for the many believers there that are suffering uh, through this murderous war. And God, we pray that you'd be with them. We pray for their safety. We pray, God, for courage, for strength for each day, soundness of heart and mind. May they know the sense of your presence each day. Father, we pray. Today, that you'd be ministering through our missionaries that are all over the globe. The hunters in South Africa, Lord. The uh, Otto uh, Guanilo and his family, Lord, in, in Argentina today. Lord, the Chattersons that are serving you in Ireland. Father, we pray for the Russian believers that we're supporting and 
and helping Vasily and his sons, Lord, in church planning in Nizhny Novgorod, Russia. Father, empower the word as it goes out today. Use it to transform lives. May they know the joy of seeing believers come to a place of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Enjoy a day like we're enjoying today, where there's blessed baptisms and people coming to join the fellowship of their churches. Lord, empower your word as it goes forth. In churches in this city today, in truth, across our province and our nation, God, change us. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. One of the things I'd just like to quickly point out for you is in relation to this psalm is its placing in the scriptures. I don't know who put it all together. I don't know how the thought went into it. But you'd have to believe that God's somehow behind it. In Psalm 37, you have the Israelites in captivity in Babylon. And their captors come to them kind of mockingly and say, Oh, sing, us, sing one of your songs for us. They said, we can't sing. We can't sing. He says, by the rivers of Babylon, verse 1 of 137 says, There we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For, those, for there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And then they said, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Well, for us that are Christians, I don't know if you realize it or not, but we're in a foreign land because our homeland is heaven. <laughs> That's my home. This is my second home here on earth. But my real home is in heaven with the Lord. And I'm thanking God that he has allowed us, even here in this place this morning, what? To sing a song unto the Lord. God can enable us to do that. And that's what David says in contrast to Psalm 137 where the people are saying, we can't sing. David says in Psalm 138, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart before the gods. I will what? I will sing. I'm going to sing anywhere, everywhere about the name of my God, about his great salvation. I will sing. David lifted up his voice to the Lord. There's a lot of reasons to be thankful. David begins here by giving us his devout re resolution in his heart. He's resolved that he's going to praise God. And I'm resolved I'm taking this coat off because I'm melting. <laughs> you think that's an awful thing for a preacher to do? Go stand on the baptism there. It's hot water. <laughs> they forgot to turn off the heater, literally. You know, you can take a bath there afterwards. So I'm hot here this morning. But as, as we come to this psalm and see what David has to say to our hearts here, it's a personal thing. I will. I will. I resolve. I will do this. And I want to say to you, it needs to be a personal resolve in your heart if you're a Christian. We call this Thanksgiving Day. But it should be more than a day, shouldn't it? This should be something that encompasses every day of our lives, taking some time to stop and think and give our praise and glory to God for who he is and for what he has done in our midst. This is David's testimony. I will. What will you do, David? I will praise. I will praise. It's interesting. He doesn't really tell us who he's going to praise until about the fourth verse. But he says, I will praise. I will praise you. Well, David, how are you going to do that? Well, you know, I don't really feel like it, but I'll do it a little bit. No, I am saying, he says, I'll praise you, Lord, with my whole heart. I'm going to put everything I got into this, from the tip of my toes to the top of my head. I want to praise you, God. I've been thinking about you. I've been learning about you. I'm growing in you. David, in another place, says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Shouldn't we come here that, with that attitude as God's people every Sunday morning? Oh, no, it's raining. I wish I didn't have to go this morning, but, oh, I'm on the praise team, or I got junior church, or I got to do this. No, we ought to come here with hearts filled with praise, longing to be with God's people and 
lift up the praises to him that, that is worthy of all of our praise. I will praise you with my whole heart. This is not only David's testimony, but understand this. This is a call to us to be what I want to call 100% Christians. I'm not saying 110%, 120% because there's no such thing. But we ought to be 100%. Everything within us given to serving and praising and worshiping and glorifying our great God. Today, hear the call of God. Over in Hosea chapter 10 and verse 2, God talks about the children of Israel there who were called God's people. And he says there in that, that, that verse, he says, their heart is divided. They are guilty. Understand this this morning. If there's some limit to your heart being given to God, there's some guilt. What he's saying is God accepts what? Wholehearted worship wholehearted with every part of our being we want to serve him and worship him and glorify him one of the things we learn in the scriptures is that god hates half-heartedness in the worship of his people he wrote to a group of people in a church called laodicea and he rebukes them because of their half-hearted love for god their lukewarmness he said, I wish you were either hot or cold, but not somewheres in the middle. We're ho-hum. We'll sing. Or we'll stand there and let others sing and we won't bother. No, he says, throw yourself into it. Listen, people here will tell you if you're a visitor, I can't sing a lick. But when we sing, I'm going to sing. I'm going to lift up my voice to God and trust that somehow he can take this croaking and turn it into music in his ears. He wants us to sing, to lift our praises to his name, wholeheartedly before God. Christians really need two things. To be a Christian, you need a broken heart over your sin. You need to mourn your sin. You need to come in repentance and faith in Christ. But once you've repented of your sin, what do you need? You need a whole heart to praise him. A whole heart to glorify him. A whole heart to follow him and serve him. We've been talking in the Gospel of Mark about the great commandment, which says what? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your what? All your soul, all your mind, all your spirit. What he's saying is every bit of you just praising God, giving glory to God for who he is. That same passage in Hosea says in chapter 11 and verse 5, he said they refuse to repent. He says they spoke lies about him. When we don't give everything to him, we're really speaking lies about God. We're saying he's not worthy of all of me. I'll give him a part Sunday morning. But Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that's mine. I don't, I don't need to praise God on those days. No, we need to praise him and thank him every day of our lives. Give it over to God. So there's a call here to us to learn what it means to be wholehearted. You see, if I have a wholehearted love for God, I found this. It spills over into every area of my life. I can be on the golf course, and if I'm loving God the way I ought to love God, I've told you one of the things I do. I take my golf ball, and I put a red cross on there with a marker. And I always turn it so it's sticking up. When anybody's golfing with me, they look down. And they'll always ask me a question. What's that red cross stand for? And I get to tell them about Jesus that went to the cross for me and died and paid the penalty for my sin. Now, I'm not overbearing. I'm not in their face. If they don't want to hear it, I don't push it down their throat. I don't think we should do that. But listen, we, we ought to show them that we have this joy in the Lord, don't you think? Whether you're playing golf or watching the Maple Leafs, I know it's also time to cry. But I'm a Maple Leaf fan. I know it well. I've been crying since 1967. <laughs> but it really, it speaks to the totality of our commitment to God. I will praise him with my whole heart. He's not talking about that physical organ that pumps blood through your body. But it, it speaks of the heart spiritually. 
and spiritually in the Bible, when it speaks of your heart, it speaks of your mind. It, it speaks of your will to make choices. It speaks of your affections. All of that's encompassed at the very core of your being. David is speaking these words in sincerity. He searched his heart. He's not just throwing them out there kind of as bragado. No, this is something he's thought about. And Lord, I will, I will, I will do this. I'll follow you with an undivided heart. There's a verse, the reference to it skips me right now, but where the psalmist cries out to God and says, Oh God, unite my heart. Why? Because it's easy to have divided hearts, isn't it? You know, we got a lot going on. You know, we, we got to go here and do this. We got to go there and do that. And I know even before the baptism, somebody talked about the lights, and then somebody came in suff suffocating hot in there. Please, you got to go shut the the uh, heat pumps down and, and all this sort of thing and, and everything's going on. It's easy to get divided in life. And the one thing we've got to remember is through it all, we need to ask God to unite our hearts so we can praise him and give him thanks with a whole heart. Those of you that have been baptized, those of you that are coming to join together with us, we want to encourage you to make this a major part of your life to worship God and serve Him and, and praise God from the very depth of your heart. So I would ask you this morning to look into your heart. Now listen, don't, don't waste your time looking at somebody else's heart because you really can't see it. This is a call to look at, for me, from my own heart. This is a call for Gary to look at his own heart. This is a call for you to look at your own heart. It's a call to say, is my heart right? Is it united? to follow God and, and to worship Him this morning. Is my mind in it? Is my will bent to it? Is, are my affections set on Christ? The heart's so important that it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 that with a heart man believeth. Right? We believe Him with our mind, our will, our affections to God. We, we, and if we confess with our mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you know what it says? It's glorious truth. You will be saved. That's the promise of God that he lays before us. He's talking about his faith. David's talking about his faith. And says, I'll praise God with a whole heart. He's saying, my faith is the expression of a wholehearted faith. Praise and worship and singing and service. There's no half room for half-heartedness in the heart of David. Now, for time's sake, I was going to go to Psalm 103 this morning, but I'm not going to take the time. You can go there and read the first five verses, Psalm 103, later on. But I, I want to kind of stick with the passage here. And I know my time is short. I've talked with a number of Christians recently. They might not have used these same words. Sorry, I'll stay here. Uh, they might not have used these same words, but basically they were saying this, Pastor, I, I just don't feel as close to God as I used to be. I feel like my heart's grown a, a little bit cold. Why, why is my heart cold towards the Lord? Now, I'm not saying in every case, but I'll say this in a lot of cases. This is what I found over the years. That I know Christians that have been saved for 20 years and call themselves Christians, but they have never yet one time read through the Bible once. Just take this, write it down so you don't forget it, because it's important. A closed Bible will lead to a cold heart. You got to get in this book, you got to read it every day. Saturate your soul, your spirit with the preciousness of the Word of God. And I'll say it again, the problem with most people that have a cold heart, and if you got one this morning, you ask yourself, have you lived with a closed Bible? I was going to ask the question, how many of you, <laughs> don't raise your hands, how many of you have a closed Bible this morning while I'm preaching? You ought to have what? An open Bible there so you can look at this text and see what it says. Am I really preaching the truth of the Word of God? David's words weren't empty. It says over in Ezekiel, you should look it up. I, I won't take you there this morning time. Ezekiel 33, down around verses 30, 31, 32. God says to Ezekiel, you know, the people are coming to hear you preach and they're saying wonderful things about you. 
You know, I'll go to the back this morning. Some people walk out, oh, marvelous baptism this morning, Pastor. Great message this morning, Pastor, and so on. And they were saying that about Ezekiel. They were going to their neighbors and saying, hey, you ought to come and hear Ezekiel preach. He's, he's really good. But then God says, but they don't obey you. They're not really listening to your words. They're not hearing what you're saying. Oh, they hear but not hear because it doesn't make an impact upon their lives. What would God say about that? He said, that's spurious spiritual talk. It's false. It means nothing because it hasn't changed and transformed their lives. It's unhealthy for your spirit and your mind if you're not wholeheartedly in love with God and seeking to worship and praise Him. I said before, David took the time. How, how could he write a psalm like this? Because he took the time to think. Think about what God was doing in his life. And sadly, one of the things that, that is a problem for a lot of Christians today, and I don't know you, so I'm not sticking my finger in your face with this, but Christians today don't want to take a lot of time to think. They want the word in sound bites. I guess tweets. Text messages. They don't want a message that's, oh, pastor, you're so long-winded. We, we don't have a heart to get that. Well, I want you to know we can't be the kind of Christians we ought to be with soundbite Christianity. We need to be a people of this book, of this word, and a love for the word of God. And that love for the word brought David to the place where he says, I'll give you thanks with my whole heart. Now, throw away my notes. I just want to walk you quickly through what's left in this passage, just so you can go back to it yourself. Again, this isn't just good-sounding rhetoric, but start with verse 1. I'll praise you with my whole heart. Where, David? Before the gods I will sing you praises. The gods, the false gods. He was going to go out where people were worshiping their false gods and sacrificing their sons and fire and all these things. He said, I'll go before the gods and I will what? I will sing your praises. Some think the word gods there may refer to the World leaders and so on. David said, I'll stand before kings, God, and I'll what? I'll sing your praises. I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm reminded of Paul as this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it's the power of God to salvation. I won't be ashamed. We need Christians today unashamed of the gospel of Christ. Before the gods, I'll sing praises to you. I learned what that meant when I was in India a number of years ago. Walking down the streets and seeing the pagan temples and the idols. And the people that were leading us, they said, we we're, we're talking a little bit about, about things in the Bible. Said, Don't mention those things out here. Certain religious area here and we don't ever dare speak up for God. I can't imagine what would have happened if we began to sing Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But David says, I'm going to praise God even before my enemies. Verse 2, he says, I will worship toward your holy temple. And that was a habit of the Israelites if they're away from Jerusalem where the temple and before that the tabernacle was. They would, when they prayed, they'd get up and they'd face towards the temple and they'd pray out of respect for God to remind themselves who they were praying to. And David says, I will worship towards your holy temple. I will praise your name. We have a lot of people walking around today, and yes, sadly, Christians doing a lot to praise their own name. This is the church that I have built. This is the organization that I have... No, no. Our praise belongs to who alone? To God and God alone. Let's praise him. Lord, I'll praise your name. And then he says this. What are you going to praise, praise his name for, David? Well, he's thought about it. He says, for your loving kindness, your chased love. It's the grace and the mercy of God. I thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness and your truth. What's interesting 
in the years that I've been a Christian, and that's over 40 years, the two things I've seen attacked most by the world out there and by other religions is, oh, your God's not a God of love. He lets this happen and that happen and the other thing happen. And they attack the love of God and they attack the truth of God, the word of God. That's why if we're going to stay a church and here at Devon Park Baptist Church, we'd better learn to what? To lift up in our song because that will strengthen our resolve. The love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God. And we better learn to stand and hang on to every day the truth of God. His glorious truth. You ought to praise God this morning. I was thinking about this for what I want to thank God for. I want to thank God that I have the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in this book we call the Bible. A book without error. A book without falsehood. A book that God has given to us to make his name known. So Lord, I'll praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. Even, even says this, for you have magnified your word above all your name. Now, you need to be careful there because I don't think we want to get into bibliolatry where we're worshiping the Bible. But what he says, Lord, you lifted up your word. And, and Lord, whatever you said, you're going to be true to. That, Lord, you're committed to being what? A faithful, truthful God. Listen, the day that God ceases to be faithful and true... There'll be no reason for us to follow him anymore, right? But he is a faithful God. He's a truthful God. And so we love him. We worship him, David says. Verse 3, he says, In the day when I cried out, God, you answered me. He's telling us this morning, don't let Satan drive you to the place of despair. Don't let him get to the place where you have no hope. You need not just to devote resolve to worship him but you also need a grateful recollection of what God has done in your life to think back how many of you had answers to prayer this year you've seen God do some marvelous things in your life just answers that he's given to you David says in the day when I cried out you answered me the day I cried Lord you heard me doesn't mean he got everything he thought he wanted but he knew that God heard him and I wish we had a lot more time to talk about this, but he says this. Here's what God did for me. He says, and made me bold with strength in my soul. The word bold there is you gave me courage, God, to face what I was facing. You gave me the courage that even though maybe the circumstances didn't change overnight, Lord, to walk through that and to get through those circumstances in my life. And you walked through it with me, Lord. You made me bold with what? With strength. What do you need when you're going through the depths? You need strength. Not human strength. You need God's strength. And you can get it through prayer by crying out and calling unto God in faith in his name. Lord, you made me bold with strength in my soul. Do you remember Paul came to God three times and said, God, I've got this thorn in the flesh. Lord, take it away. And three times God said, no. He answered him, but he said, no. But he said this, my, my grace right? It'll strengthen you. It'll see you through. My grace is what? It's sufficient for whatever you're facing in your life today. He is sufficient to deal with that. I had a call from a lady yesterday who's desperate. Her husband died in the past year. They both lost, had lost their jobs. She has a debilitating disease. And she owes an electric bill that they've told her if it's not paid by Wednesday of $1,100, they're shutting off her electricity. She's desperate. I want you, just pray for that lady, would you? Let's pray if maybe there's something we can do as a church that we could reach out and help meet that need to, and let her see that what? God answers prayer and encourage your heart in the Lord. Verses 4 and 5, David says this, All the kings of the earth shall praise you, Lord. Now he's, he's looking with anticipation to the future. I think clear to the day when the gospel of Christ was going to begin to proclaim and, and even kings would hear it and put their faith in Christ. And, he's, and, and ultimately that day we've been talking about in Mark, when after their seven years of terrible tribulation strike this earth, Jesus Christ will come descending on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem defeat the 
nations of the world and their wickedness and establish a thousand-year kingdom on earth. In which what? All the kings, all the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord. When they hear the words of your mouth, when they hear the gospel of Christ, yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. And I don't know about you, have anybody here ever hear a king sing? Or a queen sing? I, I've never heard or seen that happen. But if they found Christ, they'd have reason to sing, wouldn't they? Just like us, they'd have that reason. Lord, we want to sing. The kings will praise you when they hear the words of your mouth. They will sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. You know, there was Nebuchadnezzar was the king that was going to put Israel into 70 years of bondage. But in the middle of that, he's confronted by Daniel, and he's confronted by God. And he says, what? Daniel, you're God. He's God. Not the gods of the Babylonians, not the false gods, but what? The true God. You're God. Our God's able to do that. I love verse 6. It says this, though the Lord is on high, and God is exalted, he's filled with fabulous glory. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly. Now, when you get men of high estate in the world, most of the time, what? They just walk by the forsaken of the world and the lowly. They don't have time for them. Aren't you glad today that we've got a God in heaven that has time for the lowly? He bows. He comes before us. He beats the deeds in our lives. Listen, he not only sees us, but he, the word there, he regards us. That is, he pays attention. He cares about what's going on in our lives. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly. But listen, listen, if you're here and you're filled with pride, but the proud he knows from afar. There's something about a proud heart that distances a person from God. Christian, don't allow pride to creep into your heart or it'll do that to you. If you're an unsaved person and it's pride that's keeping you from coming to Jesus Christ, swallow that pride and come to Jesus this morning. Give your heart to him. Come to him in repentance and faith. Why? Because if you will humble yourself, you'll lower yourself. He what? He'll regard you. But if you remain proud and stubborn before God, filled with arrogance in your heart, You'll keep God at a distance in your life. Verse 7, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. By the way, you are going to walk in the midst of trouble as long as you're on this earth. There's going to be tough things that happen. There's going to be bad messages that arrive from the doctor and others in your life. You're going to know that <coughs> in the midst of trouble. You'll face an attack of the enemy, Satan. You'll face the attacks of those that don't love Jesus. You'll, you'll face doubts in your own heart. How many Christians, since you've been saved, you've had days of doubt? Come on, let's be honest here. I guess I'm all alone. I've, I've had some of those days. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, Lord, I know this, in every occasion, you will revive me. You'll give me life. Lord, revive your church today. Give us life in this church. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. Lord, you're going to protect me, and your right hand will save me. And then here might be one of the greatest portions in this whole passage, and I, I can't talk much about it, but it says this, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. That which concerns me, God's going to perfect. The idea there is bring to completion. The Bible makes a marvelous problem to us as Christians, or a, a promise rather, not a problem, a promise to us as Christians that what God has begun, he'll what? He'll complete. He'll finish the job in our lives. He'll finish it. If I've trusted him as my Savior, he promises to save me completely, fully. He's not going to drop me halfway through and let me go to hell. If I've repented of my sin and trusted in Christ, my soul is secure in Christ today. That's my message to you that have been baptized, joining our church today, those of you who have been longtime members here, and if you're just visiting with us today, let the word of God speak mightily 
mightily, powerfully to your heart. God loves you. How do you know that? Because he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to suffer and die on a cruel cross, to take upon himself the wrath, the wages against your sin that belonged to you and bore it in his own body, that if you would believe what he did, you would believe that he died on the cross in your place. That you would believe that when he arose, God had accepted his sacrifice in your place and offered you salvation rich and full and free. You can't buy it with money. You can't earn it with works. You just have to believe in Jesus Christ. And I'd love to talk to you more about that at the end of this service. I'm just going to pray a quick prayer. And then I'm going to ask those of you that are joining in membership with our church today, would you please come and just line up here across the front, would you please, in that moment. Father, bless your word to our hearts. Help us to be a people filled with thanksgiving, not just today, but tomorrow and the days to follow. We have much to praise you for. Lord, bless these closing moments of the service. Bless those that are coming here to be joined together in the fellowship of this church. Pray, God, that it would be a meaningful, powerful time in their lives. We're blessed by it. Help us as a church to embrace them, to make them feel increasingly welcome, to help them find a place of service. But God, unite our hearts together, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.